this is no small matter we're dealing with here. We're not talking about trespassing, robbery, or even murder. We're dealing with a crime much more serious than that. Oh, no, the crime of the year right in my own camp. No, the crime of the decade. No, Director. Not the crime of the year, nor the crime of the decade. When any person doesn't give their life to Jesus, they will go down as committing the crime of the age. Welcome back to Boys Bible Study. It's us, the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego of podcasting. I am your co-host, Ash. I am here with my co-hosts, Scott and Julian. And today, our special guest, we have Dan Koch, the host of You Have Permission podcast. Hi, Dan. Welcome to Boys Bible Study. Thank you guys for having me. I feel like I've just been baptized into the Christian Oof. B-movie world. Oof. And it only took a half hour, which is shorter than most baptismal services take at church. So <laughs> that's good. Still needed a towel at the end of it, though. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, Dan, uh, now I know for a fact that some of our listeners uh, listen to You Have Permission. Um, however, for the people who don't, could you please introduce your podcast and, and what it's about? Yeah, it's basically a, a show about taking Christianity and the modern world seriously at the same time which for me leads to a kind of a progressive Christianity, uh, which we can talk about if you want to. Um, but basically looking at psychology, history, sociology, other sciences, and uh, the Christian faith specifically. Yeah, it's been going on about two and a half years. I don't know what else to say about it, except that it's, you know, it's it, it can be a little brainy sometimes and it can be more fun sometimes. So maybe just look at the titles and pick an episode based on what sounds good to you. Because, you know, not everybody likes all of them. Sure. Yeah. Well, I love that about the show. You're, you're committed to covering a broad range of topics. And um, it's cool it's that- It's a really shitty ad, yeah. though, to give for your own show. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, like your, I like your perspective because, if I'm not mistaken, you're, you're studying or you have studied, you've completed like a degree program in, in psychology and stuff I like that? I'm still studying. Yeah, I'm getting cool. a doctorate in psychology. Ooh, cool. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank and you. You're all you got to do is, is pay. And then they'll let you do it pretty much. Can you talk about what your focus is in that? Because I remember hearing it once and thinking it was pretty interesting. Yeah. Uh, my own research, which is in its infancy, is about spiritual abuse, which is kind of an emerging area of research. Um, the The shortest definition is like it's it's usually a kind of emotional and psychological abuse that is related to faith. It's usually involving a religious figure or taking place in a religious setting. Uh, or containing a religious element. Like for instance, you molest someone and then afterwards you tell them that God wanted you to molest them, mm. that that was part of God's plan. That would be sex abuse, but also spiritual abuse. They would be coinciding, right? Uh, less intense versions of spiritual abuse might be like a pastor claiming to speak directly for God, something like that. Mm. So that's what I'm, that's what my own dissertation is, is working toward. And there are a number of episodes about that topic on the podcast, including uh, yesterday's, well, this will come out later this week. So Monday's episode, which was uh, with one of the world's foremost spiritual abuse researchers. Oh, that's amazing. Oh, yeah. I, I enjoy that, that particular intersection uh, of, of your perspective and, and what you bring to Christian commentary. So um We'll be happy to, uh, to to call that out from you when we talk about Christian crime uh, in this <laughs> film that we had you watch today, Crime of the Age. Uh, what is your experience with Christian films, however? Have you seen many of them? I have seen very few. Uh, mercifully, I was raised uh, what I like to call a California evangelical, which probably means different things to different people. But for me, what it meant was like a moderate evangelical. My dad was a therapist. So we would never have fit in like fundamentalist spaces from the beginning. Um, my mom always liked to tell jokes with swear words and they would have the occasional glass of wine. So I didn't get some of the really intense upbringing and I was allowed to listen to secular music. So I got into Christian music, for instance, when I got into ska, because mm -hmm. at that time, oh, yeah. Christian ska <laughs> was as good as other ska. I mean... You put Five Iron Frenzy up against the Mighty mm -hmm. Mighty Boss Stones or Real Big Fish to this day. I mean, they're they're equally good bands. Uh, and no, so no, Five I Iron Frenzy to, is much better. They're yeah, actually they're much better. <laughs> they are Five Iron might be the best 
sort of ska punk band that ever came out of the whole scene. Um, and so I didn't ever have to like watch Christian movies. It, it wasn't like I had a friend, right. Who the Sega Genesis game that he, that he was allowed to have was like the Noah's Ark Genesis game. <laughs> I, I didn't, I was not in that family, you know? So, uh, I, and then of course I knew that Christian movies were bad. And so I just never watched them. And, and literally I've seen, I saw a week away because we did a patron exclusive episode where we did a, a commentary on it with some of my friends and I've seen, ah, like I've never seen any God's not dead, no fireproof, sure. no facing the giants. I've never seen any of those movies. Sure. And so, uh, your guys's podcast has been interesting for me to, to listen to here and there because I just, I just don't know this world at all. Sure. Well, yeah, we're really happy to to have shown you one today, which is by some of the best Christian filmmakers. Uh, if you at least if you think of the word best in terms of like most influential, most competent, like people who've made some of the most famous Christian films. So, you yeah. know, you can now after today say that you've seen a Cristiano Brothers film. Um, and this one is called Feels Crime good. of the Age. Let's, uh, before we get into it with Dan, let's talk a little bit about the Cristiano Brothers. Longtime listeners of our show will absolutely recognize those names. But for people who are just joining us, um, would uh, would you give us a bit of an intro, Scott? Sure. They're two brothers who love making movies first and foremost, and then love Christianity secondly, uh, pretty closely, but they definitely <laughs> like movie making the best. <laughs> And other movies of theirs we've covered are The Daylight Zone, which had the same protagonist, uh, lead actor anyway, who's fantastic, Keith Salter. Um, time Changer, which is a Christian time travel movie. Classic. Jonathan Sperry. The Secrets of Jonathan Sperry. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and quite a bit of other things. And, you know, there's two of them, Rich and Dave. And depending on whatever feature they're working on, they might like switch on and off exactly what their duties are on this particular film. Uh, Dave was the director um, and the two of them together wrote the film. But uh, but Dave Cristiano directed this one. The, the style of their movies is very particular. Like, I feel like I know a Cristiano Brothers Christian film as soon as I'm watching it. It has this very like glowy kind of like it's eighties. It's like very eighties technology, but it has this like sort of white, like glow to everything. If that makes sense. It reminds it to me, it's like what classic Sunday school movies look like to mm -hmm. me. Like, does that, does that make any, like, do, do you, do, do you, what is it that I'm seeing that makes me think that? I think they also have that like early eighties, um, family movie wonder to them too. Yeah. It's all nostalgia. I think is what you're talking about, right? It's just, Totally. I don't, my guess is that it has nothing to do with sort of the artistic vision in this case and everything to do with just the technology that was around when you started to fall in love with filmed media. That's probably true. Yeah. yeah. They are a little like sub made for TV movie level, <laughs> like, um, like clearly done as quickly as possible, which is without like cutting corners. They just have like, a method to making a movie that they don't really ever falter from. Yeah. Like we're going to get the wide, then we're going to get the shot of the person saying the line, then we're going to get the reverse of the person reacting. It's like not anything. They don't have like a style to them. Right. It's the lack of <laughs> style is their style. That's That makes sense, yeah. I imagine they always stay on budget too. It is like, it's it's pretty crazy. Like the budget of this short film was minuscule, I'm sure. Um, but that wasn't a problem. Like it could have been a pretty good who done it. Like regardless, it's it that's not the thing that bugged me. If anything bugged me, it wasn't the budget. It was like so they they seem to be doing something quite competently within their budget, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's I think that and uh a testament to that is you know how how prolific they have been, you know, within this genre. They've through throughout the decades, they've made quite a bit and films that are much more ambitious than this one too. And they've been able to execute their ideas, um, which shows uh, the efficiency of their workflow. 
but um and television with seventh street theater <laughs> right they they have this show i can never remember was that dave or rich who did that show that's not the hugest deal dave who was dave it was dave mm-hmm. uh D- dave had this sh- like show called seventh street theater which was uh it was like this but like 30 episodes of this and it was about like a christian <laughs> theater troupe um and it's just like so funny like i i, I just I don't really even know where this anecdote's coming from, but I just always think of how we found the website and like there's a, a quote from Dave on there where he's like, it was very difficult because like the actors had other commitments and it was hard to like get them all together to like make the right. show. Yeah. <laughs> so no budget. Like, yeah. Right. Which is like, it's understandable, but it's just like so funny the way that he just like said it out. Like it was like, the the people having other things to do was like an inconvenience to him. Yeah. I, I can't, it was There's just a funny ten, phrase. Tinge of disappointment in right. his actors who are working for <laughs> well, free for right. taking right. other jobs. Right. <laughs> when you're used to just like using whatever volunteers are at your local church, yeah, uh, and then you have to deal with people's conflicting schedules, it might start to sting a little. Totally. It's also like because the subject matter is so like lighthearted and inconsequential until you get to the meat of it, which is if you're not a Christian, you're going to burn in hell for all of eternity. Right. right. I think when you come at it from that viewpoint, you're going to be a little upset at people for not taking it as seriously as you do. Yes. (laughs) Considering you're taking it from the point of view that like this is going to save people's lives. Yes. Yeah. And actually, Dan, um, with your point of interest with psychology, like what, what do you think about that? Because a lot of these movies we watch um, will have a at least some people in them who were clearly were being exploited <laughs> for free labor mm-hmm. um, just because they're part yeah. of the same church. What do you think about that? <laughs> uh, I think that when people have sincere convictions about the eternal value of their work or messaging, that it becomes very easy for the ends to justify the means. I think you see this with a lot of the evangelists who were connected to colonialist forces. Hmm. Um, yeah. Like you would, you would have a hard time understanding how they could put up with the kind of military brutality and whatnot but if you posit that they thought that it was the only chance that these, you know, air quotes, savages would, you know, know Christ and be saved from hellfire, it makes more sense that they would put up with that. And so I think that, you know, they're in that sense, they're in a long line. They're in plenty of, uh, plenty of company. Um, it's one of the, it's really one of the darkest sides to, um, what I would consider kind of a hubris or overconfidence in one's knowledge about eternal things uh, is this kind of, yeah. And of course, uh, a minor exploitation of an extra on a dumb film, m- much, much less of a deal than, uh, you know, the Indian reform schools that right, we set sure, up yeah. all over America, <laughs> but uh, that you could be traced back to a similar kind of pre-commitment. I would say the Christianos are as bad as Columbus. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Could Columbus have could Columbus have patterned a 30 minute film on the board game and film clue? Yeah, I don't that's think true. he could have done that. <laughs> no, I don't think he, he could. Cares. He demonstrably could not have done that. Um so well, shout course. outs to our boys, the Cristiano brothers. They killed it again. Also, it's still it's exploitation, but th- I would imagine there's a healthy portion of people who help out on these because they believe in the cause. I and would they're do just it. having a little fun. Yeah, I would, I, mean, do, it. I would do it. We've I been would. very close to doing it we ourselves. Will. <laughs> we, we will, will one day. soon. <laughs> yeah. Um but yeah, well, you know, the Christianos are are really serious about the concept of eternal damnation. Like um hmm. like Scott and Julian were saying, like, I mean, that's definitely true of I most of the you know, hardcore Christian films that we watch, but it's like every Cristiano Brothers film makes a point to say, like, completely unequivocally, like, no, you you will be a Christian. You will tell other people about Christ. You have to save these people from eternal damnation. Like, there there is one path, yeah, to heaven. Well, and th- th- that makes a bit more feel. sense. Like the the emphasis on evangelism makes sense because I was just thinking, like. What I was going to say is it's so odd to me that that you could make a product that you know is only going to the choir 
basically. Right. It's like if somebody signed a CCM deal because they really wanted to reach the lost. Like, no, <laughs> that's not going to, yeah. you know, that you are going to be in like Christian soccer moms, minivans and church lobbies. Like that is where your music will be played. But if you see your work as equipping the church to go out, you know, and save the lost, then that's different. And that is uh, logically basically makes a lot more sense. Yeah. And in particular with this movie, um, they weren't just trying to tell you how to be saved, but they were also uh, kind of nicely suggesting to Christians in the movie uh, ways that they could improve at being Christians. Oh, yeah. Not, not so subtly. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I, this could be a good point to start talking about the the content of Crime of the Age. Um, this is a 1988 film from the Cristianos. Uh, it's about a half hour long. It is definitely a comedy in a way that some of their films are definitely not. So that was fun. <laughs> you know, it's nice to have a little yeah. bit of a laugh from from our boys Rich and Dave. But. Uh, what's uh what's what's going on this film uh dan maybe maybe start us off thinking about this film i would say it's kind of like a nervous laughter comedy though because (laughs) of those eternal stakes which are pretty clear you know um you do you do laugh so so basically it's set up kind of like clue the detective shows up to the christian camp before the students show up for the summer and it's a whodunit about who took this book from the director's desk called How to Become a Christian. And actually, there's a really good beat at the beginning that I really liked where the detective says, so one of your staff members is probably not a Christian. And he's like, what? And I thought that this was because a Christian would never steal. That's what I thought he was getting at. So the person who stole would be not a Christian. But then it was much better. It was like, no. Why would someone take a book called How to Become a Christian if they were already a Christian? One of your staff members is not a Christian. Oh, no, this is terrible. How can you be so sure? Think it through, director. Why would a Christian sneak in here in the middle of the night and take your How to Become a Christian book unless they weren't really a Christian? Oh, no, this is terrible. But which one is it? The lifeguard, the nurse, the cook, the coach, the secretary, or the groundskeeper? I don't know. But, detective, you've got to find out before noon tomorrow. That's when camp starts and all the kids will be coming. I'll do my best, director. Uh, And that kind of sets up the plot. And then he goes and he questions each of the six staff members. And they lay it out really well at the beginning. It's just him and his six staff members. So you know from the top, like, okay, it's a whodunit. And there are seven possibilities if you count the director, right? Right. But which one is it? The lifeguard, the nurse, the cook, the coach, the secretary, or the groundskeeper? I don't know. But detective, you've got to find out before noon tomorrow. That's when camp starts and all the kids will be coming. I'll do my best, director. And then they go through, he talks to everybody, and uh, it ends in kind of like everyone's all in the room, the final interrogation scene, which leads to basically a a filmed altar call. Anything I missed? Yes. Yes. Uh, Well, definitely that was like the gist of the whole movie. Um, And I would love to start by talking about that, that beat that you were talking about, because, yeah, that really like piqued my interest right away. Um it was interesting that like, I don't know. It's just like I, the film's premise from the beginning really kind of fell apart for me because it's like, yeah, that book is there to be taken. You know what I mean? Like Like that. Yes. Why? Okay. I I wrote this down. (laughs) I wrote, I wrote this down. This is my elevator pitch for the film. Okay. Get this guys. (laughs) The crime is that someone stole a book that is meant to be given away. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. It is yeah. an evangelistic book. It is the kind of book you buy five copies of and keep in your truck so that when you meet somebody throughout your week, you can be like, hey, you know, do you know Christ? And if not, you give them a copy of the book. Yes. It is that it, kind of a book. It's weird that it was not just the Bible too. Because like Gideon's Bible serves the same purpose. Right. And yeah. it's just the Bible. Like you're supposed to read that. But this is like the Bible for dummies or like the Bible reading (laughs) companion or something. A Bible Um, home companion. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. It's, uh, 
yeah what are you doing if you're such a good christian like why do you why is that book on your shelf like i don't know yeah it's so fun. it's also that like particular version of like brain rot that some people have where they're just like why would you not just read things that you agree with or like why would you right. why would you ever expose yourself to any media that isn't stuff you already know and understand right well so i actually i had a little note about this beat right here right that like this idea that According to the detective, somebody who was already a Christian would not want to pick up or have no impulse impulse to pick up a book called How to Become a Christian. Uh, but here, my own work around and other people's work around like religious trauma would kind of kind of gives the lie to that assumption uh, because I have personally interviewed more than a dozen people who have told the story of how they were never sure that they were a Christian. They prayed the prayer obsessively people who struggle with like OCD like symptoms or mm. religious scrupulosity is the, is the technical term for when that kind of stuff is, is religious in nature. And like, that is a very common story. Mm. Uh, and so like it, the idea that it would be unthinkable that a Christian would pick up this book, how to become a Christian is like, so obviously false to me. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, totally. You know what I mean? That's a good point. Got to be sure. You can read How to Be a Christian and also be a Christian already. Right, right, right. Because right. you love Christian literature. Sure. And you probably should if you're going to be around a bunch of campers all summer and that's like one of your main textbooks. Yeah. Right. Yeah, maybe you just want to have, you just want to be kind of up on like, the, the most recent take on the Lord Liar Lunatic argument. You just want to kind of, <laughs> you know, you want to have that really fresh in your mind for talking to the kids. But I guess like the idea was that because there are characters later on who admit to wanting the book, but going out and buying it despite being Christian and that's okay. But like you're saying, if you stole you the book, it. then it shows that you are not a Christian because you didn't know that stealing was a sin. Right. Because only a Christian would know that stealing is wrong, but oh, you still good. have to be not a Christian to read the book. Right. But you are a Christian because you knew not to steal the book. You knew to buy the book. Right. And if you were a it's Christian, very circular. <laughs> if you took the book, you would you would let the director know, hey, I borrowed the book. Yeah. But you would risk incriminating yourself, you know? Well, that's the that's the who done it part, right? But I gotta true. say, I mean, as not a Christian, movie, you would risk it, as, identifying to, yourself as not a Christian. I can break into his room in the middle of the night, and just wait <laughs> until the morning to get to yeah. ask him if he could borrow the book. So the the movie pulled a little bit of a stunt that is similar to the stunt that you guys pulled with me in choosing this movie. <laughs> okay, go on. So hear me out here. This is our Gallag <laughs> this is our Gallagher moment. We walk off. Okay, so I said. We were emailing and it's like, what kind of movies do you like? And I said, my favorite genre of films is crime. <laughs> and <I'm concerned. laughs> okay. And so you went and found a movie with the word crime in the title. Sure did. That contains no crimes. Really? Well, well okay. <laughs> the crime of not being a Christian is okay. a crime exclusive no, okay. to this. Well, let me get It's a crime yeah. against yeah, God. Yeah, yeah. Sure. The film actually does not really contain a crime. It, it contains like, I borrowed your book and didn't tell you I borrowed it. We're still on the same property. I can simply give the book back to you. Yeah, um, true. Whereas tell in it to the, the film, judge. they talk about. They talk about how the crime of the age, the titular crime, if you will, <laughs> is to not accept Christ before you die, which last I checked is not a crime. Right. Tell it to either. God, the biggest judge. It's not a crime. <laughs> it is like whatever it might be. It's a failure. It's a, I, I don't know, call it what you want, but like by no definition of the English word crime is not becoming a Christian a crime. Nor is taking the book in the film Crime of the Age, which is not a crime movie, after I told you I wanted to watch a crime movie. It's more of a misdemeanor movie. It's more of a crime of the age movie. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, a cri it's a criming of age movie. Yeah. It's a criming of age film. <laughs> well, you know, so so as you were saying, this, this film is very clue-like in the fact yeah. that we have a lot of different, you know, suspects and each one is given this this cute sort of 
designation. It's also very like breakfast club. Like, you know, we have, we this have was the, the best thing about it. I think. Yeah, totally. Yeah. It was very whimsical. We have the lifeguard, the coach, the secretary, the groundskeeper, the cook, uh, the nurse, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so a running conceit of this film is that like, although each of these people claim to be Christians, there's actually really big fundamental flaws with all of their Christianity, um, which I thought was, you know, one of the most fun parts of the film. No one in this film was really a Christian, you could say. Maybe we could start with uh, one of the characters and talk about their personal failing and uh, and 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 go from there <laughs> does that sound like a fun format <laughs> this was very yeah, this tedious? was kind of like no but well we don't want to go through all of them probably yeah, that's but probably like, true <laughs> you're right that this sort of this uh it, it's really procedure in the in the purest sense of the term right yes it's very much a procedural where he goes through the same procedure with all six employees staff right. members and and that was like that was one of the things that made the production value not matter at all because you're so like it was actually pretty good storytelling in that it really masked that like these are not that great of actors it's not like it doesn't look that good but you're like oh he's going to ask the qu- he's going to ask the carrot question yes. he's going to do this <laughs> you're following you're following the pattern like someone telling the story around a campfire Yes. You know, like a good, like a spinning a good yarn, yes. basically. Okay, here's here's what I can say about that. This film did one of my favorite Christian movie tropes or storytelling techniques, where a character just like says something out loud that like just completely just like sheds light on their moral failing. Like I yeah. love that. I love when people <laughs> yeah. I love when people so like readily identify their own personal moral failing and then just like yes. say it out loud. Like I love the character that's like I think it's the nurse who was like, oh yeah, you know, I was walking around, I was I was meditating on the fact that the kids are about to come to the camp and the detective's like, you were praying? And she's like, I don't pray. like i love that so much like that type of thing is what keeps me coming back to the genre um it's just it's so fun i almost like want to be one of the characters in this film that's just like (laughs) so certain of the way that i like think and like can't really identify my failings to the point where i'll just be like oh i'm a christian but i just don't i just think going to church is boring you know (laughs) like why would anyone do that yeah it's so good. Well, I like okay. her take on why she doesn't pray, though, too. What was that? She she said she figures that God's going to do what God's going to do. Yeah. Hmm. And it's hard work to pray. Was I think the yeah. other thing? Yeah. <laughs> Praying? No, I never pray. How's that? Well, I figure it this way, Detective. I mean, God's going to do what God's going to do, no matter what I say. Plus, prayer's hard work, and I've got so much on my mind, especially with camp getting ready to start and all. I just try to be a good example. Hmm, that's odd. A Christian who doesn't pray. Interesting. Okay, so yeah, she says it's hard work, but meditation is much harder than prayer. <laughs> yeah. First of all. yeah. Now, I don't know what they meant by meditation. It's not like she was like reciting Ohm or something. She was just kind of like thinking about it, thinking yeah. about the fact that they're coming. And that would yeah. maybe be, I don't know, about as hard as prayer, but certainly not much harder than prayer. You should never <laughs> Not much think. easier, rather. Never think but only Ash, pray. <laughs> uh, you're, you're, I'm not like the type of guy who wants to psychoanalyze uh, guests on my show or yeah. hosts when I'm a guest. Yes. But there is something uh, <laughs> interesting, I think, about this like desire of yours yeah. to be in one of these campy films where you role play the like silly version of the faith you were given. <laughs> am I, am I hitting on something? Yes. Apparently. You are really hitting on something. I don't know exactly what it is, but uh, I'd like to unpack that a little bit. Oh, I mean, I'd that's love interesting that. to me. I'd love that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just like, I'm, uh, I, I just, I just love, uh, camp. You know what? I just, I, I desire that. And also I desire a, a camp return. Or camp. Right. I mean, I mean, high camp, of course. Okay. I don't mean, <laughs> I don't mean like, <laughs> like camp, like going to a Christian camp. <laughs> um, I, I just, you know, uh, to be, uh, I'm not, listen, I'm not trying to say that I'm like particularly smart or like smarter than anyone else. I'm just saying the, 
the I I, I resent being self aware. I really wish I weren't. I think that like my life would be a lot better if I weren't, or I don't really think that, but like, I can't help, but like really be jealous of like people who I perceive as having like a total lack of self-awareness. I'm like, Oh God, I wish that were me. Um, so I think that's part of the reason why I love these films so much. I mean, obviously we're seeing like Mm. fictional things, but like, yeah, we see so many characters or so many types of storytelling where it's just like, how did you not, think that this was insane and I wish I could be you. <laughs> I, w- yeah. I wish I was not. I think so much shit that I'm like that I'm like uh, I would not want to share with the world and I like wish I were like smart enough not to if that makes sense. Um, <laughs> anyway, I or hope that answers your question. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, well, it's actually no, it's it's like a roller coaster. So you're dumb enough to not notice it. Then the yeah. roller coaster dips down and you're smart enough to notice it and say it. And then if you go back up the roller coaster, mm. you're smart enough to notice it and not say it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and so you're just like just smart enough, but just dumb enough. And you're in the dip of the roller coaster. Totally. Yeah. It's a really weird ride. You know, I wish I was on a different ride. <laughs> it does remind me, uh, I studied philosophy in undergrad and it's a really common feeling among, I don't know about like real philosophers, but certainly people who do that kind of work, that there is a very real sense that often people who, who have taken that step, um, often wish they could go back in, yeah. in some sense. Like it's not really better to go back. Like Socrates is right that an examined life is ultimately better than an unexamined life. Yes. The kind of joy that you can experience with an examined life uh, outstrips the joy of an unexamined life. But there are times when that naivety, uh, that kind of almost like, almost like a pre fall innocence. Yes. um, Feels. And I guess, especially if you come from a tradition that took that story literally like I did, it feels better. Uh, and actually this is, I don't know how deep we want to get into the theological. Let's go. Here. That's, that's why we have you on. Okay. Part I of figured why. that might be why you, one of the reasons you wanted to have me on. Um, so one of the things that separates in some sense, like a more of a progressive Christian outlook from a more traditional or classic Christian outlook, which is basically a Greek philosophical idea is um, and Brian McLaren does this really well in his book, A New Kind of Christianity, and he he draws out these these simple diagrams. But basically, the we would all recognize the Greek notion filtered through Aquinas and Augustine before him, of like there's perfection in the garden, then there's a break and the fall, and you imagine the line. The line was going straight across. Boom! Now it's vertical down, mm. and now we've fallen. And then at the and then we get saved. And boop, we're right back up to the same place of perfection. And now the line keeps going forward, us in heaven, right? Alive right. and heaven. We have restored what was lost in that innocence of the garden. That's the right. old view. That's the Greek view. And McLaren wants to replace it with uh, a steady ramp. We start lower and we end higher. And this is what God is doing throughout time in the cosmos as well as in an individual life. So when I was a child, I liked childish things, but now I'm an adult and I can handle more and I can become more like Christ. Uh, Theosis is the theological term for becoming more like God, perfection, uh, sanctification, right? And that language is uh, systematically kind of ignored in evangelicalism because it doesn't fit with the Greek model of perfection, fall, and reperfection. But I find the the progressive view in that sense of, you know, just imagine, you know, basically a diagonal line that's going up, uh, that fits better with my experience of the world. And it also, I think fits better with placing Judaism and then Christianity within the context of a four and a half billion year universe and a three and a half billion year earth. Uh, and you know, whatever it is, 500 plus million years of biological life and 200,000 years of biological human life. And we're at some place on that. Uh, and it's, and it's going, it's headed somewhere. Um, so, okay. End of, end of my little soapbox. I like that because, um, it's just unrealistic. Like yeah, the idea that, yeah, there's just like, 
it's it's one hundred percent, and then like it's it's down, and then it like dips up to a hundred percent. Like it, like I'm not like saying it's this very, very binary. Well, it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's binary. Black and white that's thinking. It. Yes, and it's black and white. It makes it like you know. Obviously, I mean, I know that like the point is like obviously like we we have imperfections and you know through through prayer through asking for forgiveness and you know ultimately be, being saved by god you know that um can take our sins away but you know even just like it, although that's understood and in a way we know we're working toward an impossible goal on earth because we're inherently flawed it still is just like very difficult to operate within that framework even even with that that understanding given you know it's just it's hard. I, I think that that just like makes it seem completely impossible from the get go for so many people, you know? Yeah. But the film shows us that the evangelical has a way out. Oh my gosh. I, I sound like a David Attenborough talking on planet earth, <laughs> <laughs> the mollusk, uh, you know, the evangelical has a solution to that, which is no, but you just like, you do this thing and then you're good. So right. all of the all the difficulty and gray area and messiness, Ash, that you just said, none of it it none of it's actually real. You just you do the thing, and then that, all that is taken care of. Right. And you don't have to worry about it anymore. Right. Yeah, and I mean, certainly this film and the tone of it like comes from that point of view. This film is like so neat. You know, obviously it's it's a film. It's like. Right. It's, yeah. it's scripted. It's it's supposed to be like, you know, a fictional <laughs> representation of, of human interaction, but it still is like the way it, it uh, you know, like uh, d- depicts human interaction is like so tidy that it's like unbearable, um, which well, is okay. like something I find typical of the Cristiano's work in general. <laughs> I would imagine it's typical of a lot of Christian films and at the right. risk of talking long twice in a row, please go. It's the perfect time. <laughs> I, I, I took some notes. This is the main section of notes I took during the film, please. which is that like in a lot of ways, this film, uh, some of the, the background assumptions of the point of view of the film, uh, are a perfect encap- encapsulation of, of white evangelicalism. Yes. So these are the uh, 10 things <laughs> that I noticed. And if you want, we can go back and talk about any of them in more depth, but like, I'll just, I'll just rattle them off. Please, please, please. Uh, number one, Christians all know simple, obvious Bible truths and would never need a book to figure out how to be a Christian. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If you're a Christian, you already know that. Number two, novels are fine. Fiction is fine, but really we should just be reading the Bible. <laughs> Number three, the fact that the nurse meditates is suspect. Right. Uh, right. Number four, a pastor, the pool kid, his pastor went to seminary, and that's why he says he doesn't need to read the Bible. So a pastor having gone to seminary is basically Catholic, and it would mean that, like, so seminary is bad, right? Because this is like low church evangelicalism. <laughs> right. Uh, and so you don't need a pastor. If you, if you go to a pastor who went to seminary, you might be tempted to not read the Bible yourself, which is what you should really do. We don't need that book learning. We just need that old time religion. Exactly. This is cool. I feel like we're on Letterman or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, except, yeah, right. The top 10. Uh, these are mostly in chronological order throughout the film. Number five, um, Christians are very worried that there might be a hint that they gamble. When the when the, coach, <laughs> when the coach was like, I, I had to bet, and I'm not a gambling man. <laughs> uh, number six, all Christians need to read their Bible, go to church, pray, share their faith, and consider all sins to be very serious. So the detective, as he talks to each of these characters, is basically laying out an implicit vision of what a Christian life is like. And that's like a perfect description of, of what I was given growing up. Yes. Number seven, Christians know not to steal the book and buy it instead, which came up earlier. Um, number eight, this one, I think this might be worth diving into if you mm-hmm. want to. The simplest little interaction with someone can be an entrance for the Holy Spirit to change someone's heart. It happens for all six staff members. After I talked to you, I went and start solving my sin problem. Yes, yes. Right? Mm-hmm. And that's like the person on the plane. You never know what you might say to someone that might put them on the path towards Christ. Right. Yep. So you better be on. Yep. 
You better yep. be on. Yeah, so that's that's then the consequence. You have to be on all the time. Right. Uh, number nine, uh, quote, first thing you got to do is deal with that sin, end quote. And uh, this is not the gospel by any means. And Dallas Willard, the USC philosopher and Christian author, called this the gospel of sin management, which actually replaces uh. the gospel of discipleship of Jesus. And mm. so actually- it's not 10, it's only nine, because I want to give the film credit for number 10, which almost makes up for the other nine, which is where uh, the book, they quote the book as having as saying on page two, a Christian is, quote, a person who lives their life for Jesus, end quote. And that is also something I heard as an evangelical. Yes. And if that is the thing we cling to, it can actually like cover up most of the previous nine uh, and the deficiencies of those. And that is maybe the thing about evangelicalism that I sometimes encounter and encountered that I love about it. There is a simplicity, a simplicity of like, it's about following Jesus. And that's also kind of a California vibe mm -hmm. where it's like not so uptight and not so ritualistic and, and, you know, not so much like Southern manners and all that stuff. Um, and so I, I wanted to give it credit for that. I was taught that too, growing up evangelical in, in Ohio, that the, the that main it is thing just about is, Jesus. Yeah. That's the, that's the main thing. Yeah. Yeah. And so when evangelicals can do that, and I have a, I have a good buddy who's a Calvary chapel pastor and he's just the best kind. He didn't go to seminary. He doesn't really read. He doesn't really go into all that deep of sort of theological reflection, but he also doesn't care if you do and he doesn't tell you you're dumb for doing it sure he doesn't think you don't need seminary it's just not like what he's like and sure. he's a great pastor and he just wants to encourage his his congregation and he's a good dude but he doesn't pretend that he knows the same thing as somebody who has their doctor of ministry yes right and yet that, so that's when it becomes a problem is when evangelicals like the bit about, yeah, my pastor, he went to seminary, so I don't need to read the Bible. That's like, that was actually probably my favorite little theological moment uh, to, to sort of scoff at in the film. Well, you know, there, there's a lot there I would love to unpack, but the first one that actually came to mind that I thought was very interesting specifically for film discussion was I think the second one you said about like the fact that like you don't really need any other books. You just need the Bible. Yes, because I think novels that, and fiction, right? Right. So I think that that's a really interesting thing with the Christianos because I do see that often as a theme in the Christianos work, but like huh. let's, let's not forget that like we are watching a fictional like right. entertainment product that these men have like <laughs> spent their entire life's work is like making like fictional entertainment products for, for right. us to enjoy. It's, yeah. it's a very a interesting short story. Yeah. It's a very interesting, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, little, that's uh, why they always turn to the audience at the end. Yes. Say, so what are you doing watching this movie? Yes. You're supposed to be reading the Bible, you idiot. Yes, that's You're supposed to be eating healthy vegetables. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's, that's so true, Julian, because like, I feel that that's, I often feel accused by the Cristiano brothers yeah. and not just because they're saying like, Oh, you're a sinner. You're like, I know I'm a, you know, I know I'm a sinner, obviously original sin, blah, blah, blah. But like, I, I literally feel accused by them that I'm even watching their movie to begin with, that which is, is like, yeah. awesome. which is like a tone yeah. that I don't <laughs> feel from almost any other movie ever that I watch like Christian or non. Like I can't think of a movie that like looks at me and is like, you are an idiot for spending your time watching this. Like, what are you doing? It's really funny. Like a That's a special kind of self-loathing. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the conservative politician thing where they're like, Oh, look at these idiots that are voting yeah, these for fucking us. Politicians. And it's like, yeah. yeah. As you, they run yeah. for office. And it's like, look at you, you, you fake Christian watching our movie. <laughs> That's meant for Christians. <laughs> right, right. That is exclusively distributed to Christian right. outlets mm -hmm. and churches through a Christian distribution company. Right. And, you know, they get into that a little bit with the character of the cook who is depicted as like being a Christian music fan. And you almost get yes. the impression that like the Christianos are suspect of entertainers that are making Christian content yes. in general. Of course, you do spend time doing other things like reading the Bible and praying. Not me. I've got my Christian music. That's all I need. You can learn a lot from the lyrics, you know. Hmm. That's odd. A Christian who only listens to music. 
Interesting. And he's the one who does it. He's the right. He's the guilty character. Right. Are That's we doing true. Spoilers? That's true. Is that a silly yeah. Yeah. Question? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> but like, I thought about that too. I didn't know how to quite put that one in there. I was trying to figure out how to word that to put it in, but you, you guys have got on it better than I was able to think about it. But yeah, you're right. You know, he he ends up arbitrarily being the guilty party. He's the one who's depicted as the one who uh, is the most into Christian entertainment media. I was really annoyed by that. Yeah, yeah. But also kind of respect the the who done it that actually like one of the suspects is the person. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. <laughs> I kept expecting it to be like oh flip it on its head like it, it is the director or right. it's a scooby-doo situation yeah right? yeah but it was actually just one of the people or, that or like the director learns his sin of like questioning everybody around him and being paranoid and yeah. really the book right. fell underneath his bed or something no it was a person <laughs> right. he did kind of get it by chance though yeah, by yeah. Saying, i was really hoping yeah. early on at around the six or seven minute mark that it would be some kind of lost situation where it was like purgatory yeah and that explained why you had all these Christians who were doing non-Christian things yeah, that it was right. like an alternate reality, but mm. alas, we didn't quite get that. That would have been cool. Yeah. My hope was that it was going to be this, this was how I would have written the movie. Um, if the Christianos want to maybe adopt me and make me Ash Christiano, I think that would be like really <laughs> cool. So if you guys are listening, consider that. But like what I was thinking would happen is that he would interview the final person, whoever that would be. And that person would be very sincerely like, like, no, I'm not a Christian. And I'm very curious to know like what it's about. And like, I want to pray and I want to do these things. And they would have been revealed as like, even though they don't think they're a Christian, they're actually the truest Christian because they don't like claim to be something and then like not act that way. So it would have been like a great like lesson learned for everyone else. Whoa. They would you know never I mean? do that. Right. <laughs> because that <laughs> right. would require somebody being like, I'm not a Christian. Like you don't, right. it would inherently be like you don't have to be a christian to <laughs> live true. a christian yeah. life <laughs> which yeah. is just like not what they're about they're very much about uh the titles i guess that's true yeah you really have to be like explicit with your identity self-identification yeah. and in christiano in christiano world it was which was like the f major flaw with all of these people that they were pointing out was that like, for all we know, they were perfectly fine, good, upstanding members of society, but because they didn't check every single box of being a mm -hmm. Christian in the Cristiano terms, they weren't, th not there only was a potential they not, that they weren't. Was, right. It was strange. Huh. Yeah. A Christian who doesn't pray. Yeah. It was yeah. like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> Despite yeah. the fact that they, as Scott said, admit that they believe that God is in control of everything. Yeah. So what's the point of praying? Yeah. Sure. Well, that one is, <laughs> like, yeah. That's an interesting, like that could have its own kind of unpacking what the, what the nurse says about why pray if God's going to do whatever God's going to do. I feel like that's a little bit prescient to like what a lot of more liberal Christians are working through in, in 2021. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I want to see a version of this film where somebody dubs in, Every time that they say the word Christian, they replace it with the word Cristiano. <laughs> <laughs> so he's just like, huh. That'd be more Cristiano accurate. Who doesn't pray? And it's like obviously <laughs> someone else's voice. You, you know, something you said, Dan, made me want to just like talk a little bit about what goes on in the other Cristiano film, Time Changer, which is like one mm -hmm. of our absolute favorites, like Christian films of all time, like on the podcast. Like it's like one of the ones that inspired us to like start this, which oh, basically is a guy goes into the future, like a Christian from like, I don't know, the early 1900s goes in the future and he like observes people in modern times, like with a time machine, I'm obviously. And he like observes people in modern times and like, the whole film is just him seeing people like he'll like see like a young girl and the, the girl will be like, I'm going to drink alcohol even though I'm 16. And he just goes like, <gasps> and that's like yeah. the whole movie. Like the whole movie <laughs> yeah. is just him like gasping and like looking to the audience as if we're going to be like, isn't this like horrible? Like he's like, he's like involving us and in how just like horrified he is by like the time we live in like that. That's literally the whole movie. Yeah, totally. Oh, yeah. He it's screams like, about the movie. He does the thing where he's like, don't watch the movie. Yeah. He yeah. goes into <laughs> the movie We're watching theater. a movie. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's so funny. Okay. That's really, okay, it's really interesting. I mean, I have two two layers here. The first layer is that I know evangelicals like this personally, boomers and older, you know, like uh, 
silent generation or whatever, who really just do wish that most of the world was like the 1920s or whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Not the roaring 20s with the flappers and the short <laughs> skirts and the short hair, but you know what I mean? Like more traditional. I mean, a lot of times I think that they would really prefer to live in Muslim countries sure. where things were just buttoned up. They just feel more comfortable that way. I mean, I know people who read that like Amish romance novel stuff sure. because, and they're not Amish, but it represents a kind of chaste time that we've moved beyond that I think is disorienting for a lot of older conservative people, whether they're Christian or not. I'm sure you find the exact same thing in Muslim and Hindu society and and whatever among older people. So that's the first layer. The second layer is that the Cristiano brothers have one foot in that world and then one foot in the modern world, because Mm -hmm. what they really want to do is make films, which are a modern art form that are not old school, that do push boundaries, and they are having to, so my little, my, you know, not knowing them, my sort of analysis is that they're working that out, and that's why these films contain this self-loathing bit yeah. of like, why are you in the movie theater? Yeah. <laughs> like, why are you reading novels and not the Bible? They're uh, definitely self-flagellating in the Yeah, they're bay. working it out. <laughs> it, it, it's sort of like a, it's almost like a, um, a celibate gay Christian kind of a thing. Where yes. it's like, God made me gay, but God doesn't want me to act on it. And that's the tension out of which my sort of creativity of all kinds will flow. Because because that is a kind of a enough friction to make a real fire. And I would I would even wonder, just like so many of our greatest poets and filmmakers and novelists and musicians are personally tortured. I wonder if it's probably too much to assume, but like maybe that tension within them is what makes them the best of these Christian filmmakers is that they're working that shit out. I love that. That has to be. <laughs> That's a film paper ready to go. Yeah. Yeah. I do hope that one of our, our college age listeners will, will do something on that. <laughs> Please send it to us. Cite, yeah. Don't yeah. forget to cite us. <laughs> don't forget to cite. How do, you, how do you cite a podcast no. in MLA these days? I don't know. You can, <laughs> you can do it. I'm sure. Too, yeah. I've done it before. <laughs> But um, you know, actually, uh, something else from your um, your 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 list of like analysis points that I just wanted to hear more about. I, I just had never heard this term, and I was genuinely uh, intrigued. Was what do you mean by like sin management? I mean, you explained it a little bit, but I was yeah. I was hoping you could go into that topic a little more. So Dallas Willard is um, I don't know one of the great Protestant thinkers of the last hundred years. I think that's hmm. safe to say, and he was a guy who really took uh, the discipleship of Jesus seriously. So this is a guy who is a USC philosopher. So he is, you know, this is a coveted academic position, right? Mm. But this guy lives in a very simple house. People describe people who have, who he mentored have described it in their books you know, usually they're like prologues or whatever, where they're talking about where they got the idea for the book. And it's like the, almost like this shack in Simi Valley with like a super loud air conditioning unit that he never replaced. And he died that way. He never spent money. He lived a very simple life. He wrote extensively about sort of spiritual disciplines, about prayer, um, about really like what he saw in in the gospels. And I think that he was accurate in terms of what someone at the time of Jesus would have understood as well, that like the rabbinic model of that time of second, second temple Judaism is sort of like what we would say today with like a monk who starts a new school of Buddhism and has, you know, 20 followers. Hmm. Um, and then you go into that school of Buddhism and you get a master you know, that is your guide and they tell you what to do. And you, you basically say, I want the wisdom you have. I will live like you live. And it's a massive commitment. It's a lifelong commitment. And Willard saw that like that, when, when Jesus says at the end of John, um, I think it's John, you know, the great commission, 
go and make disciples of all nations. He calls it the great omission that we take the word disciples and turn it into converts, which is basically Mm. what this film is doing, right? Making converts. Uh, Although uh, maybe some of the the stuff about like going to church, reading the Bible, praying, there's some discipleship vibes in there, right? It's not just about converting, but the, you know, sharing your faith, that's obviously kind of like a make converts kind of a thing. And Willard said that this robust type of faith that is available to us of like making Jesus our life's teacher and practicing the things that Jesus practiced and through those practices coming into contact with the God of the universe in a, in some sort of similar way that Jesus himself did, we sort of sell ourselves out and we don't pursue that. And what we end up doing in our churches and our Christian communities is just sin management. So if I could fill it in with a little bit of my own sort of psychological language, Please. I would say that um, what Christians and Christian uh, institutions and churches end up doing is we manage our anxiety about the unpredictability of life and the unpredictability of our children's futures, of our own futures. And we try and manage that anxiety with control. And what can we control? Well, we can't control the weather. We can't control what people do. We can control whether or not we gamble or drink Mm. alcohol or ever look at porn or ever swear. We can control those things. So what we'll do is we'll make church about the little fucking things that we can control. And we will actually lose sight of the call into a life with God, which is about flourishing and deep experience and deep connectivity to each other and to the earth, uh, and to our, and to our past. Um, and so that's the idea of like sin management is like, um, in that sense, it's such a small fucking pitiful excuse and, 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 uh, replacement for the kind of life that Jesus called his followers into and that we are called into through the Christian tradition today, if we want to take it and we, and we sell it out for this, this kind of bullshit sin management stuff. That's so interesting. Yeah. Um, the, the, a couple things in there, you know, one little thing you touched on was like disciples versus converts. And I wanted to know, yeah. are you familiar with the work of Ray comfort? <laughs> oh <laughs> wait i know that name he's he's our he's one of our kings uh one of our like <laughs> pantheon of like uh christian christian slash he's technically a christian film well yeah he really is he's made quite a lot of like long you could call them films but he's that guy he, he's very he's the new zealand guy he's he's very famous for his like comparison of like the banana is proof of like uh, intelligent design basically because it like, oh. he's like, it's a banana. <laughs> it has a handle. It, it's, it was meant for humans to eat. It like has, you know, oh, and like, no. I mean, we could, yeah. you know, that's obviously, but what he's really interesting is he, he makes like hundreds of films where he just like goes around to like, you know, the Venice boardwalk and, uh, and you know, <laughs> yes, <laughs> or like yes, college campuses. What, okay, I've seen that. And, yeah. Yeah. I've seen and that. He, he fil- yeah. And he always like, he gets, he traps people and it's clear that like the people are like with him, but they just like, they, they just don't, they just want to leave. They want to exit the conversation. So they just right. like say whatever. But, and he, he always goes, so you admit you're a liar, a thief and an adulterer. <laughs> and like, he just like, gets into this like entire spiel that like we right. basically know by heart because we've logged like hours watching his movies because we also self flagellate in a way. Um, but you know, talk about someone who just wants to make converts. Like it's like, so I thought you're going to say content. Well, that's, <laughs> that's <yeah. laughs> he ends he was, up making content, content not yeah. disciples. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, um, I, I think of, I think of that when I, I, when you said what you were just saying, which was like, and there's something of that in the Christianos too. It's like, you know, his, yeah, the Christianos, their, their fictions are more elaborate. Um, you know, it's way more sophisticated than Ray comforts, but there is still this, like this, uh, this sense that, yeah, you leave a Christiano film and, um, you're, you're basically supposed to fall in line rather than rather than really explore your faith rather than really have this like right. inspiring, you know, thought provoking connection with the divine. Um, 
I would love right. for a Christian filmmaker to simply make a beautiful work that makes me curious about God and curious about heaven and curious well, about the divine, you know? But of course those films happen, but they aren't marketed to Christian right, audiences right, because right, right. Christian audiences don't want that. Right. I was going to say, I feel yeah. like, uh, like, you know, however anybody feels about this movie, but like tree of life is trying to right. Tree of life. Like I was a thinking lot of about the, works like that. Totally. Beautiful the McDonough film. brothers, Calvary in Bruges. I mean, these are yeah. films that are like thoroughly Christian uh, but they're like actual fucking crime movies, you guys, um, <laughs> with guns. The, Chekhov's gun is a real gun in those movies. It's not a book called How to Become a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> or a broken the first carrot. Scene. No, but, Chekhov's carrot. <laughs> I, Chekhov's, car- Chekhov's uh, not bitten but broken carrot. Um, yeah. Wait, so what? Okay, I'm not going to go down the what happened with the carrot rabbit hole. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Nobody who's listening watched the film. Um, what I was going to say, I, I I feel like I just I just got a little bit, I, I went a little too far when I said Christian audiences don't want the films you're talking about, Ash. But uh, I think it was Ash that said that. Um, since I can't see any of you, I'm happy yeah, to complain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but it's not true because plenty of Christians watch plenty of great films. Um, I'm a Christian and I don't watch these Christian films at all. And I watch all kinds of films and I often find God in them, or I find sort of religious messages that, um, are inspiring or I find to be, you know, accurate or whatever in these other films. So, but, but the, the product line that appeals to like when people want one of these products, a pure flick subscription or whatever it is, that audience is not looking for something that will challenge them. They are looking for something that will remind them that they are in the right tribe and that they are on the right side. Although I I will say the, this Cristiano film would maybe even sort of convict a, a watcher, a viewer like that, that they could be doing it better. So in that sense, it's like a little Mark Driscoll sermon or whatever, you know, like <laughs> spurring you on to better deeds or a Jonathan Edwards sermon where it's like, yeah, I'm in, but like, I'm also a fuck up and I need to hear that every once in a while. That's, that's its own kind of sure, particular sure, type sure. of Christian psychology. Yeah. Well, Dan, you say you're a Christian but you're watching a movie called How to Become a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> why would you ever watch yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. What's why? going on? You're supposed to be watching the the history channels, the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> why would you come on our podcast? Like, shouldn't you be reading the yeah. Bible? <laughs> <laughs> why would you be making content? Right. 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 Well, also, but I mean, yeah. Yeah. Oh no. Please go on. No, I was just gonna repeat our thing about the Christiana brothers. So you go ahead. Well, Jesus was the original king of content. <laughs> yeah. You're responsible for some of the best content of all time, the New <laughs> Testament. But also, um, well, I think that like it sort of brings it back home for just like one of our main goals of the show, which is just like really like who are these movies for? Um, yeah. It really, uh, you know, people watch them, especially, you know, God's Not Dead films were a big commercial success. People definitely go watch the films, but it's very... It's very unclear. It's almost like everyone's making them and watching them because they think they should be made and they think they should be watched. But Oh, I think no, no. I I I want to disagree with you. I think sure. it's way more visceral than that. Sure, sure, sure. I think that I think there are two things going on. One of them I'll steal from the guys who made um faith-based that comedy that came out in oh, the fall. Oh, I still haven't Luke seen Barnett. that. Still haven't seen that. Yeah. So I interviewed those guys, uh, Luke and their, the producer or director. Oh, how fun. On, on um, You Have Permission? On Your Permission, yeah. Oh, it's cool. something about Christian movie industry is something the title. I'll have to listen to that one. Anyway, it was good. It was a good chat. But but they actually said something that I think is, that I've been thinking about since. And they said, people like seeing themselves on film. Right. And j- people just like that. You know, you, you have uh, a film that depicts someone like you it is just enjoyable to see your life and your kind of person on the screen. So that's one thing. Right. The other thing though, the the modern version of this for liberals is watching last week with John Oliver. Last week yes. with John Oliver. 
Okay, so if you watch last week's Night with John Oliver, it's the new Daily Show. It, it, it holds the same sort of spiritual place for liberals in America. There may be some journalistic value. There is occasionally some, some even-handed truth on that show. But I think primarily people watch that show to be reminded that they are superior to uh, Republicans sure. and conservatives. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And they watch it to be reminded that not only are they – uh, in the right, but the other half of the country are fucking idiots. Sure. And yeah. this show reminds them that they are so superior to those fucking idiots on the other side. Now, conservative Christians would never think of Democrats like me as fucking idiots. They would feel bad for thinking of it that way, but they can think of Democrats like me as eternally lost. Sure. And so these films remind them that they are not eternally lost and that I am and people like me. Right. And that's not just about uh, obligation. Right. It should get made. It should get watched. I don't think that most people spend their time doing things that they think should happen. I think that that's a, a pious thing that we say, mm. and then we mostly go watch Marvel movies, right? That's what <laughs> sure. we do with our actual mm. time. So I actually think it's serving, I, I would disagree in that. I think it's serving a deeper need than that. Now the Cristiano brothers, I think is more interesting because there's a real kind of fusion and like friction fire going on inside of them. It seems like, but for the audience, I think it's just like watching the daily show or Bill Maher. You watch Bill Maher. You're like, <laughs> I am smarter than every right, other dumb right, shit right. in the world, mm -hmm. man. It's so good to be right. And I think that we need to, we need to like take a big humble pill. If we love, if we love media like that, um, it should, it should alert ourselves to the fact that we are tribal people that love being reminded that our tribe is right. Right. Uh, and that n none of us can escape from that. It's, it's a fundamentally human thing. Absolutely. Um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I think that that's a great, like, just a meta, just like why, why these movies are happening in general. Um, and it might even be a good time for us to like formally rate this film. But before we do that, are there any other like moments from the movie? I, I think that I've covered my favorite moments of the movie. Did anyone else have something from the movie you wanted to bring up? Yes. I would like to point out that the cook character in the movie says that he listens to Brian Ford. Yeah. I remember the tape too. It was my Brian Ford tape. I like Brian Ford. What was that about? Who's Brian <laughs> Ford? I don't know. Just looked him up. Some Christian musician. It was like pretty obscure though, right? Like I, I Googled him during the movie and it was not on the first page. Let's yeah, just why say. not go Stephen Curtis Chapman or something? Right. right. That's what you would expect. This was 88. Like so Do you think Brian Ford is local to Arkansas, where this movie was filmed. Interesting. You found him on Discog, Scott. He's uh, a handsome guy. Amazon. I will say. It was like a random like Amazon resale CD. Oh, interesting. No, I, I legitimately I, I searched Brian Ford. I searched Brian Ford musician. <laughs> but um, well, one thing we learned in the guise of the uh, groundskeeper is that people who are ethnically Afghani, right. if they bleach their hair can really pull off like a San Diego surfer vibe. Yes. <laughs> Just like a tan surfer dude. Actually, yeah, I did want to shout out our groundskeeper, the, the the actor who portrayed the groundskeeper in the film, Donnie uh, Kishawars. Um, I might be pronouncing his name wrong. I, I want to say second actor from The Sopranos that we've now seen uh, in a Christian film. Uh, oh, of nice. course, uh, The King... Uh, Vincent Pastore uh, okay. <laughs> did appear in um, I Fell in Love with the Church Girl, uh, which I highly recommend, Dan. Um, you have to watch that one. It stars the rapper Ja Rule. Uh, and uh, Vincent Pastore <laughs> plays um, a, a strong supporting role. So so shout out. Yeah, uh, this this guy, um, Donnie, uh, Donnie K Kishawars, uh, he plays a minor role as uh, Ahmed's friend Muhammad in uh, The Sopranos, um, two Muslim guys who are uh, customers at the, frequent customers at the Bing. Um, so shout outs to Donnie. Um, love to see that. I have two, I have two little bits please, here just please, before please. we're done. Uh, the only low budget thing that bugged me was the fact that they were just repurposing some sort of kitchen area for the candy store because there's just <laughs> no need to have two jugs of Crisco 
at a candy store. <laughs> they would be in the kitchen. They would not be next to the Starburst. Um, Kids are just chugging and, that stuff. I'm telling you. And then I got to say the the final line of the film, you know, we were joking as we were watching about how do you like carrots was repeated, like kind of ad nauseum and got a little bit old with uh, each of the six suspects. He asked it of all of them, one after the other. But then the final line of the film, which is really supposed to be, do you know where you'd go if you died tonight? Uh, it instead is, do you like carrots? audience member, which is, I thought was like the best version of, do you know where you'd go if you died tonight? I've ever heard in my life. Genuinely clever. Yeah. It was clever. Hold it, director. Huh? Hold on just a second. What is it? Out there in the audience, I sense something. What's wrong? Excuse me. May I ask you a question? Do you like carrots? They, they risked the chance of us not coming to Christ for a dumb joke. <laughs> <laughs> In some ways. Okay, if we didn't pick up on it by then, I don't think that yeah. that's on In them. some ways, the most subversive <laughs> thing the Christianos have ever done in one of their <laughs> films. You're about to go up to the altar and you're like, yeah, that's funny. You forget <laughs> what you're doing. Yeah. Um, if only, if only uh, this film is actually where Bugs Bunny got his start. Uh, he played a very minor supporting role. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, you know, this was a look at, uh, yet another Cristiano brothers film. We are slowly on our journey of covering every single major Cristiano brothers film on the podcast. One I had never seen before crime of the age. And we were lucky to have Dan Coke of you have permission podcast review this with us, uh, boys and, uh, and our guest, Dan, what did we think of this film? Let's give it the official boys Bible study rating. Uh, so I said when we were watching, I was really hoping that the twist was going to be that we are seeing the seven personalities in Jesus's head <laughs> interacting in like a dream world. So in that sense, I wanted a Christian version of the movie Identity starring John Cusack. But instead, we got a Christian Knives Out. And that was just fine. Um, so I give it a perfect score of three out of three pairs of socks. <laughs> Warren for ankle support. <laughs> yeah. That's good. I like your socks. Oh, thanks. I always wear three pairs of weak ankles. Yeah, that explains it. I was thrilled to see Keith Salter again. He was great in the Daylight Zone. Right. I wish he had more roles. Uh, but I'll take what I can get. This movie was wonderful. I'm going to give it seven out of seven camp counselors that love carrots. <laughs> <laughs> really good eyesight. Yeah, true, true. Um, you know, as for me, like crime of the age, like, you know, it was, you know, it was nice to see the Christianos having a little bit of fun with it. You know, there was some, we had some laughs in this movie. We had some, some winks at the cameras when they broke the fourth wall at the end, I was like, Phew. you know, my, my head just exploded. It was, uh, yet another banger from the absolute Kings of, uh, Christian cinema, the Christiano brothers. Um, I'm going to have to give this film, uh, you know, uh, t uh, seven out of seven skin knees and, and two out of two, uh, bruised chins or whatever, whatever the fuck the nurse said. <laughs> I'm going to punch it, punch in that line there. Last year, I averaged each day, 11 scraped knees, seven cut fingers, five bumped heads and two bruised chins. Uh, cause this was yet another perfect film. I've got to say, Christianos, if you're listening, uh, we're your biggest fans. Please come on the pod one day. I hope you guys can get them on the pod. One day. I will say... Uh, my, my overall take, which I've said before, is that the the conceit and the procedural nature of it overcame the budget to where I genuinely enjoyed watching it. Yeah, two, three drinks in, but still I enjoyed it. Sure. And I'm going to pull a little mathematical trick that may not be sound, <laughs> but I, I think if you divide anything by zero, it's infinity. So it's a perfect score. It is zero out of zero crimes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, because yeah. there were no crimes and it wasn't a crime film, yeah. but I think that still pencils out to a perfect score. You're not supposed to be watching crime films. You're supposed to be reading the Bible. Right. Yeah. That's right. Right, right, right. Also, <laughs> so true. we sort of figured we would do like a, you know, better to ask forgiveness than ask permission situation <laughs> with the movie. I'm totally with you. Yeah. I would have done the same. Yeah. <laughs> so we were like, yeah, let's uh, let's rope Dan into, into watching. Honestly, <laughs> this was better than probably a proper Christian crime film could have been. I do have to say, you, you should watch The Penny. 
Oh yeah, we uh-huh. it was literally. You're gonna have to give me a, a watch list here. Yeah, yeah. The, we'll, we'll we'll we'll, we'll send you more you than that. What was the yeah, twins we'll send one? You the penny. David A. R. White. Oh, double, that double one was trouble. good too. Yeah, uh, f- the twins one where David A. R. White's really hot in it. Oh, um, the crime Mercy Streets. One. Mercy Streets. Mercy yeah, Streets. we'll we'll hook you up. You have to watch these. Uh, these are like two that we would have done if with you if we hadn't have done them already. <laughs> but the, yeah, yeah. the penny That's was uh, the penny was one that like started off this podcast as well. It was like the third episode we ever did when we were still figuring out like how to do a podcast, and it's it's hilarious. It's it's such a good film. Very uh, sort of obscure, but like very underrated Christian film. But Dan, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate you coming on Boys Bible Study. I had a great time. I got to tell you guys, I do think that your podcast name and artwork combined are one of the best name artwork combos, especially in this scene. Oh, thank that I, you. That I have uh, come across. I am. I have some uh, branding and artwork jealousy. Oh, for you. Thank, oh you. thank you. That means a lot. Our, um, our beautiful art was done by... Our, our good friend, Muscles. yeah, our good friend mm-hmm. Sean Muscles. Um, shout out to Sean. Um, I, I got it. my favorite uh, podcast name in our scene. However, is Transregret Snoopy presents the Bible. There, there will never <laughs> be the one. Best, that, there will never the be one name. that tops her name. Um, and I believe I found her through your podcast. Oh, that's amazing. Oh. And then we, then I interviewed her, and then we become friends. And we did another one and we might do some other stuff and we, we text That's pretty great. regularly. So, so thank you for introducing oh, wow. me to I'm, her. I'm so glad. Yeah. Bringing Snoopy's podcasters a, together. Yeah. Snoopy's a treasure. I, I love her. <laughs> I, I love her show. I, I edit yeah, it as she's well. Great. Oh, that's my, my other project is I, I've been editing her show, which is great. That's this right. is but, the um, Christian podcasters. Christian podcast. Yeah. True, 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 true. <laughs> yes. It's like a band. It's like a band's band. Yes. Yeah. Which is what, <laughs> <laughs> Which is having been in a band for, for 10 years and, and sure. did that for my main job. That's what you tell each other when you're not as popular as the other bands. <laughs> yeah, right, right. So I don't know if you want to take on that mantle, but you know, <laughs> we'll take it if it feels right. But um, Dan, for, for people who are not familiar with your work, how can they find you have permission and how can they follow you online if you if you have people do that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, You Have Permission is the name of the podcast. You can find it anywhere you listen to pods. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Dan K-O-C-H and Instagram at Dan C-O-K-E. That's the phonetic spelling because I couldn't get <laughs> my real name. Um, and then I also have a website that I made with my friend Sari called so you're deconstructing.com, which is just a set of resources for people who are going through any kind of faith change, which is often very disorienting. Um, I, I would guess that most of your listeners are like beyond the disorienting phase to like the laugh about it phase. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they might nonetheless find some of those resources helpful. All It's all topics separated by, you know, similar stuff and it's just a wealth of, uh, of resources. I, they definitely will. Um, no, there's, there's definitely already some, some crossover. I know, I know some, some listeners of ours really appreciate your work. So, so thanks for taking the time and talking with us today. Once again, um, I had so much fun. If you guys are still making this podcast about a year from now, I would love to come back on again. Please, 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 please. Anytime. Maybe sooner yeah. than that if you're around. Um, uh, I I will uh, on the boys Bible study side of things. Let me do our, our sign off. Here. Oh, we're still um, on. Technically, yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah, let, me, dude, let me do our little okay. sign off. Here. Cool. Yeah. Um. Uh. If you are enjoying our free episodes, which by the way you can check them all out at boysbiblestudy.com, um, we invite you to check out our Patreon, where we do at least two bonus exclusive episodes every month. Actually, the one that has just come out a couple days ago, we're really proud of. We actually read through um real. Uh, Masonic rituals, and I think it came out great. So, uh, so please subscribe to patreon.com slash boys Bible study if you want to hear real Masonic secrets revealed among an entire back catalog of bonus episodes. Um, also, our outro music is Oh My Don't God. Don't tell any Freemasons. Don't tell any Freemasons, <laughs> by the way. Uh, our outro music is Oh My God by pop singer Mary. Check Mary out on Bandcamp and Spotify. From all of us here at Boys Bible Study, myself, Ash, my co hosts, Scott and Julian. Our guest today, Dan Koch, we would like to say, peace be with you. And also with you. Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. I feel your love in me, it's coming from within. Oh my God. My devotion is so unwavering. Divine emotions when you come to me. Every